Up next, we'd like to welcome Russell Banks. Russell Banks is the author of 18 novels and story collections, including The Sweet Hereafter and Affliction, which were adapted into very successful films. Twice a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, he has also published nonfiction collections, including his most recent book, Voyager. And his work has appeared in the Boston Globe Magazine, Vanity Fair, the New York Times Book Review, Esquire, and many, many other places. Plus, he was my thesis advisor in college. Russell, it's great to have you on the show, and I'm happy to see you again. I'm happy to see you again, too, Whit. <laughs> Thanks so I'm much for joining you us. You grew up. <laughs> Um, it's funny, Whit, I don't know that we've ever discussed this, but uh, Russell, you were an influence on one of my theses as well, because I wrote about uh, The Darling in, oh, yeah. my in my journalism school thesis when I wrote, was writing about literature of the weather underground. Um, oh, wow. So it's a, it's a thrill for me to have you with us also. And, and uh, so I really appreciate your being here. Oh, great. It's good. It's good to talk about The, the Darling, too. I haven't talked about it in a long while. And, and uh, uh, I have to refresh my memory a little bit. You can refresh my memory for me, I think, probably better. If you remember the characters' names, probably better than I do. <laughs> well, yeah, so it's, it's you know, I, I always like to go back to the 60s. You were, you were in college at the University of North Carolina in the 60s, and you had connections with protest movements yourself at the time, which, um, you know, you were a member of, of SDS, yeah. and you participated in civil rights marches, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that time in your life and yeah. get to the book. Uh, well, I showed up at Chapel Hill in 1964, uh, September 64, uh, coming down. I was 24 years old. I was married and had a child um, and already thought of myself as a writer. And um, I had been more or less on the road for the intervening years between 18 and 24. Um, and I had lived all over uh, the deep south, I mean, South Florida and uh, traveled in, all over too in Mexico and in the West Coast. And uh, at this time, up leading up to that, I had been working as a plumber in New Hampshire. And I had a very um, unformed um, sense of, the, of, of racial realities, despite that wandering, um, until I walked uh, into uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, and the the civil rights movement was going on, and, and within about forty eight hours, I was in jail, and um, um, you know bailed out the next day. But I mean, it, it, you could not be there and be a person of conscience. Wait, can we go back to the within forty eight hours I was in jail part and <laughs> tell us exactly how that happened? Well, just uh, demonstrating um, in Chapel Hill at that time. Chapel Hill was a segregated town. Uh, the university had only recently uh, integrated racially. Um, and, uh, but the town itself, the bars, restaurants, theaters, bookshops, everything was segregated racially. And so the students were leading with some faculty were leading the civil rights movement there with the aid of, of, uh, of CORE and, and, um, and SCLC and other um, uh, black organizations. And so um, it was, a. It, uh, it almost well, it wasn't impossible to not uh, to, to uh, stay out of it, but uh, it was impossible for me to stay out of it, and and most of the people I admired and respected. So anyhow, that was sort of the beginning of it uh, of my acquaintance with uh, racial realities. Even though I had traveled through those racial realities, uh, had seen and and. Uh, a South that was essentially uh, ruled by a part um, before that, it hadn't come home. It wasn't personal uh, for me. Um, I was a tourist uh, in it. I had been raised in almost completely white uh, society in the Northeast. Um, and I had uh, socially uh, come almost completely white life. Um, and so this was the first time where um, I had to um, uh, address those issues in a in a personal and felt um, uh, way and commit uh, to it one way or the other. Um, down there at the time, to get back to your question, um, the civil rights movement and most of the of the white uh, students like myself who were involved in it uh, sort of naturally uh, or and maybe inevitably uh, crossed over into the anti-war movement. Um, and, and, um, and that's where um, uh, that single issue uh, of race became a double issue then of race and, and, and foreign policy, polit politics um, on, a different, 
um, in a different dimension, in a different way. And that led to a wider sense of a critique, uh, I think, amongst myself, myself and, and, and amongst my, my cohort as well. Uh, so that we weren't just uh, uh, um, demonstrating for fighting and, 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 and in some cases risking our, our bodies uh, uh, on a single issue. We were, we were engaging in what began to feel gradually like um, social uh, upheaval on a much broader and wider scale. That's when something like uh, SDS became um, instrumental. Um, I'm just going to step in and say that SDS, for people who might not know, stands for Students for a Democratic Society. That was right. the acronym. Right. Yeah. So there was this revolutionary wing, which came gradually to uh, represent in the public mind um, the um, um, less revolutionary, um, much more moderate uh, wing uh, of, uh, of youth, uh, uh, activist uh, youth. So anyhow, I just sort of, uh, speaking personally, uh, I followed that trail um, up to about 68 um, and, um, and, and 70, and, and then kind of withdrew myself from a politically active, but no less politically engaged in many ways, um, uh, life, partly because I was married and now had two children, and partly because uh, I was a writer and I had to, um, to dedicate myself to that activity and also because I had to earn a living. And, uh, and so my life changed. I went back to New Hampshire where I was from and I got a little teaching job and, uh, and lived a much more kind of bourgeois uh, uh, life uh, and in many ways a, a, a more um, deactivated uh, life uh, in political terms. Uh, well, I want to connect that back to that period of time in North Carolina for you and this particular period of time, which we're going to later in this interview compare to today. But, yeah. you know, so you, your first collection of poetry, you had a, your first book was a collection of poetry, came out in 1969. I think your first novel came out in 75. So you retired in New Hampshire, but you've had this experience politically and you would go on in your career to write about John Brown, to write about Haitian immigration, to write about many black and white working class characters. Yeah. And you were rare in your generation, I think, for a white writer to have as many interracial characters as you do. Yeah. Um, how did this experience of protest at North Carolina affect the writer that you were become? Were you aware of it affecting you as a writer at the time? Or did it just not happen deep, sort of? No, on not deeply. You know, um, it's, it's, it's what you, you know, what you live ends up affecting your writing, of course. And, um, and then what you write starts affecting what you live. And, and before you know it, there's a, there's a circular uh, kind of relationship between the, uh, the two. And uh, one is feeding, constantly feeding the other. And I think that was, I was still evolving as a writer. And, uh, um, and so I wasn't all that conscious of, uh, of, um, of, of what was affecting my writing from out of my own personal experience. But it clearly was. Um, I was being educated um, in a way that I had never been educated before. And, and, and naturally within a few years that was uh, profoundly affected, uh, changed me and, and it profoundly affected my work and in a conscious and deliberate way from there. And then the work itself started to, um, to change me um, and, and further and take it further and go further yet and, and, and realize the, both the, the, the political and the aesthetic um, complications um, and um, that it, um, that, that it uh, created for me and try to devise uh, fictional means for dealing with those complications because they weren't, as you noted, um, all that available amongst uh, uh, other writers of, of, uh, of my ilk. I mean, let's say white male writers uh, from the middle class. Um, and, and so uh, I, um, I had to make it a kind of conscious operation with, I mean, where I, I, um, I think more than many writers of my generation, at least, I was in, set on saying, how can I deal with these crucial issues, um, these, these startling and, and, um, and, and, and inescapable realities that I now see around me? Uh, how can I bring this into uh, fiction that's still a work of art and not a not a, uh, a, um, a piece of propaganda or, um, or something driven solely by ideology. So it, it, was a, 
and it, very complicated and lengthy and um, partially, perhaps even some, but mostly maybe, uh, unconscious process. And uh, only looking back, I could say, oh, yeah, I see I made that jump there and that jump there. I thought I was writing about something, but I'm something else. But in fact, that's what I was writing about. We've been talking to Caitlin Greenidge about the Trump administration's attempt to manufacture a backlash against protests today. And in 68, Richard Nixon was promising to restore law and order after protests broke out over MLK's assassination. Um, in 1969, he coined the term silent majority that Trump has now tried to adopt and, and use for his own purposes. So I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about what it felt like at the time to watch Nixon run that kind of campaign and win the presidency in 68 and 72 as he did. Yeah, um, but for me, it seems even more um, uh, difficult to time now uh, in many respects. Um, one is, is the, the concentration of wealth and power um, and into the hands of a very small number of, of families and people and institutions uh, and companies, um, which was not the case then. Um, the economic differences between then and now um, are enormous, and the technological differences are enormous too. Um, and and um, they're yeah, they're both simultaneously empowering and simultaneously disempowering. Um, so I don't know. It's harder for me today to have the kind of hope I could generate still back in the day. Um, um, and um, I find so myself funny. bleaker today than I was then, um, less hopeful um, and um, yeah, more despairing. Uh, up to this moment um, and out of the last couple of months and year, maybe the last year or so, the Black Lives Matters movement seems to me to be the most positive thing that has happened in American political life really since the middle late 60s. In your 2004 novel, The Darling, uh, the main character, Hannah Musgrave, is a, is a quasi member of the Weather Underground. She comes from privilege and her father is a celebrity doctor and civil rights activist and she's certainly on the right side of history but her connection to civil rights and black activism is very complicated in a, del in a deliberate way in the novel. And I wonder if you could talk about that and read a section from the book for us. Well, this is early in the book, uh, the section that, that you suggested um, with Hannah and, uh, and uh, Zach uh, and, a, uh, and a third person, a young woman, are uh, a sort of a cell, a weather cell, um, sleeper cell. Um, in, um, in Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. And um, uh, the weather on, was, uh, Weatherman was very uh, decentralized and, and the cells were quite independent. There was no um, um, core administrative leadership or strategic leadership. Um, and it's one reason why they were in some ways most so effective and so difficult to apprehend and, and, and bring down for so long. Anyhow, she's telling this story, uh, th these pages, so I'll read it. When he wasn't working with me in the basement or driving his cab, Zach had taken to traveling to New York City for days at a time. I'm making some very cool contact down there with our black comrades in arms, he told me. These brothers, man, they're the forward force of the revolution, the elite corps. A lot of them have been in the joints. Some of the brothers are vets back from Nam, man, and they're pissed. They make weather look like candy stripers, man. I asked him if they were Black Panthers, but he said, no way, these guys are in deep cover, man. And the kind of action they're into is almost beyond politics. These brothers are much heavier than the Panthers. Again, I believed about half of what he told me, but the half I believe lifted my spirits. For years, ever since the civil rights movement got taken over by blacks and the white college kids like me and the white lawyers and clergymen were sent home from the South, leaving us with only the splinters that were left of the anti-war movement, SDS, weathermen, the yippies, diggers, and so on, all of whom were white and middle class. I'd felt somehow cheated out of my true mission, as if in my chosen line of work, I'd been deprived of an essential tool and that tool was black people. 
practically from childhood and especially in high school and college, thanks to my father's old time New England hierarchy of values, I'm sure, and his heavy emphasis on noblesse oblige, my heroes had been the 19th century white abolitionists, most of whom were educated upper class women from New England, like me. And my father had nothing for those women but unqualified praise and admiration. Among all our distinguished ancestors, Hannah, those female abolitionists are the ones I hold in highest regard. The others, the men, all they ever did was make money. Until I came along, he'd add, laughing, as if he, a world-famous pediatrician who wrote best-selling books on child care, had somehow managed to avoid making money. Thank you so much for that, Russell. Um, God, what a great book. Hannah is giving herself up here, isn't she? I mean, how can someone really be interested in civil rights and equality if they view Black people as tools? Why did you yeah. choose to have her use that term? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think it's it's uh, her use of it is pretty unconscious, of course. Um, but uh, the good reader will pick it up and say, "Oh, I see. There is some. There's a soft underbelly here somewhere." And uh, and it's uh, she on the surface of it is this tough, uh, extremely radical person um, who uh, may have extremely mixed motives for doing what she's doing and. Um, and positioning herself in society as she has. Um, and, and she doesn't know it at this time, in this time in the book. And later, uh, she begins to realize the complexity of her motivations and, 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 and uh, reasons for um, engagement in, in the particular ways that she did. There's a transformation in de-radicalization Hannah experiences as she becomes a member of the Liberian aristocracy and she benefits from this exorbitant wealth and prestige and she's surrounded by poverty and is complicit in a system that benefits very few people. And at one point, I'm thinking here about what you said earlier about despair, the part where for those of you, those of our listeners who don't watch the virtual book channel, you can look later and see how my face fell as Russell said that. Um, one point she admits, it all seemed so hopeless to me that I averted my gaze. I did not see what I could not begin to change. And I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about the role of that sentiment in the book. And yeah. if you, do you see it today? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's the consequence of falling into despair. Uh, um, uh, rage is, uh, is uh, the, the consequence of falling into rage is, yeah, setting bombs, um, killing people. Um, violence of various forms, um, burning down buildings, breaking the glass of stores, small shopkeepers, that rage is, drives that. But despair then um, um, brings you to the point where you uh, avert your gaze. You, you simply uh, look the other way. And um, they're, they're equally uh, destructive. Uh, and she's going through that second response. She had already gone through the first rage and um, it's an, in a way an equal and opposite response to um, to social realities that you feel you can't change, that, that that the powers that are arrayed against you are so great and and so demoralizing that you have no choice but either to break the window with a rock, a brick, um, or fire a gun into a crowd, or blow up a building, on the one hand, or um, avert your gaze, go live in a commune in New Hampshire, um, or um, go to work for a company that allows you to make as much money as you can imagine in as short a time as possible. Um, protect your children so they, uh, with, with a private school system and, and, uh, and build walls around your house. Uh, live in a walled um, community, um, one way or the other, metaphorically or really. So yeah, so she's going through that in the book, uh, that second um, level response um, to forces that she thinks cannot be changed. And she's facing it down in a place where, uh, well, you know, Liberia, West Africa, and, and uh, which is particularly um, um, going into a third world country, as we used to call them, um, um, or shithole country, as our president calls them. Um, is a, is a very, uh, there you're facing despair very quickly. I spent time in, in, in Haiti and, and 
other countries and in, in West Africa as well. And, and boy, it's, it's very difficult not to avert your gaze. Russell, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. I want to remind our listeners to pick up his 2004 novel, The Darling, which we've been talking about in this episode or, or any of his fantastic books. And maybe, Russell, before you say goodbye, can you get, tell us what you're working on now? Just give us a preview. Well, I just got the bound galleys um, for a new novel that's going to be coming out next winter uh, called Foregone. F-O-R-E-G-O-N-E, Foregone, and uh, Echo, uh, HarperCollins is publishing it. And they, the galleys came in yesterday, so I'm quite happy and excited. All these years later, with all these books later, it's still, it's still thrilling when the, when the bound galleys come in. Well, congratulations, we're true. excited to read it. Yeah. Is it not true that your editor is potting with you right now? Can we that talk is about true. this? Yeah, Wait, that, really, what? <laughs> Yeah, he's in our pod. Uh, he, came, he was on the 34th floor in New York City, um, running Echo from there, um, and hadn't even gotten on the elevator to go down yet. And, and I said, you know, you could do this just as easily from up here in the Adirondacks and, and the mountains. And we've got the nice little guest suite. You can have it. And so he's up here. He's been, came up in early June. He's been here ever since. And um, he's been... Uh, uh, running uh, his uh, his show from here. Oh my God, that's amazing! <laughs> Every writer's secret dream to be able to hold their editor hostage in their own home by a uh, pandemic, so they I have to know. publish their stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right, it's great to see you, Russell. Thank you, you so too. much for being on the show. I'll talk okay. to you soon. Yep. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.